from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, good evening all. My name is Taina Caragol, and I'm the curator of Latino art and history at the National Portrait Gallery, and the curator of One Life, Dolores Huerta. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Welcome to Poets Unite, a program organized by the National Portrait Gallery in collaboration with the Library of Congress Hispanic Division and Poetry and Literature Center, and with Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. Tonight we have the honor to have among us Juan Felipe Herrera, the 2015 Poet Laureate of the United States, who is also represented in the Portrait Gallery's permanent collection, by the way, I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> uh, also Arlene Biala, uh, Poet Laureate of, uh, Santa, of the County of Santa Clara in California, and award-winning poet Diana Garcia, who will read poems in response to One Life, Dolores Huerta. One Life is an annual exhibition, a series of, of exhibitions, really, that shed, shed light on individuals who, through their leadership, have helped shape American history and culture. This iteration pays homage to Dolores Huerta, a figure as central to the farm workers movement as Cesar Chavez, but not yet as familiar to the American public. The mutual identification of Chavez and Huerta with migrant farm workers, their common indignation at their subhuman working and living conditions, led them to found, in 1962, the National Farm Workers Association, or NFWA. In September 1965, their mainly Mexican and Mexican-American union joined the Filipino union named the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, led by Larry Itliong, in the momentous Delano grape strike that launched the farm workers movement. Both unions merged a, a year later and formed the United Farm Workers. This exhibition commemorates 50 years of the beginning of this movement by illuminating Dolores Huerta's crucial role in the UFW as its vice president, a strategist of the grapes boycott, that perhaps some of you remember, um, a remarkably skilled lobbyist for the union and its main contract negotiator between the 60s and 70s. It is very meaningful for us at the Portrait Gallery to collaborate in this program with Chicano poets Juan Felipe Herrera and Diana Garcia and Filipino-American Arlene Biala, whose oeuvre shares a commitment to social justice, cultural affirmation, and giving voice to communities that have been historically silenced or oppressed. Juan Felipe and Diana Garcia come from farm worker families and were born in farm labor camps. Their personal stories are directly tied to Dolores' struggle. As some of you know, this program was supposed to take place in January, but it had to be rescheduled due to the big snowstorm. What a better day to respond to Dolores Huerta's endless energy and power as a transformational figure than in International Women's Day. <clears throat> I should also add that um, I think the stars aligned to have the program tonight as well, um, because in about 50 years ago, um, right around this time, on, in 1966, in March of 1966, uh, the uh, Cesar Chavez started uh, in, in the UFW, which wasn't the UFW yet, but the union of these two um, labor unions, the Filipino and the uh, Mexican-American Union, started their march from Delano to Sacramento, their 340-mile march, to protest the conditions of, the working conditions of farm workers and to um, let the state government um, to really engage them in, in, in the struggle of farm workers. On behalf of the Portrait Gallery, I'd like to thank the poets for the privilege of hearing their responses to the show tonight. And I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Francisco Aragón, director of Letras Latinas, and uh, also to Robert Casper and Anya Creighton, as well as Georgette Dorn from the Library of Congress Poetry and Literature Center, and also the Hispanic Division. A big thank you as well to our two sponsors for this program, the Smithsonian Latino Center, who also sponsored uh, the exhibition One Life Dolores Huerta, and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. 
And thanks again to, as well to the portrait gallery staff that has worked in the coordination of this event. Um, to finish, I'd like to remind you all that One Life Dolores Huerta is up until May 15. Uh, it will possibly travel starting in the fall of next year through the country. So if you know venues that would be interested in receiving this show as a panel exhibition, please let us know. And, um, and I would like also to let you know that several of the poetry collections of the authors presenting tonight will be available at our shop. So please, um, when you come see the exhibition, also go come by our shop and, and uh, support our poets. And now I give the word to Francisco Aragón, director of Letras Latinas, who will tell you more about this program. Thank you. My name is Francisco Aragón, and I direct Letras Latinas, which is the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. When it comes to programming, the core of our philosophy is collaboration. Since establishing our presence in Washington, D.C. in 2007, we have been fortunate enough to partner with a number of local institutions and these have included such institutions such as the Shakespeare, Folger Shakespeare Library, Split This Rock, and of course, one of our partners this evening, the Library of Congress, specifically the Poetry and Literature Center. The programming Letras Latinas has carried out in Washington, D.C. has been made possible thanks to the generosity of the Weisberg Foundation. And I'd like to take a moment to thank Wally Babington, a Weisberg board member who is with us this evening. I should also say that along with the Library of Congress's Poetry and Literature Center, we've also established a great partnership with the Hispanic Division. But tonight, we are also partnering with a branch of the Smithsonian, the National Portrait Gallery. And this is special because this is the third time that Letras Latinas has partnered with the Smithsonian. The first was in 2009 when we co-presented the Poetics of Labor series with the National Museum of American History in tandem with its exhibit, Bittersweet Harvest, the Bracero Program, 1942-1964. One of the poets who presented in that series is back with us this evening, Diana Garcia. In 2013, we began a collaboration with the Smithsonian American Art Museum in conjunction with the exhibit, Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. One of the outcomes of that collaboration, which concludes next year, is the special issue of Poetry Magazine, this month's issue, March, which includes a portfolio of 20 poems by 12 poets. One of those poets is another poet we'll be hearing from this evening, U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera. But of course, tonight's collaboration will specifically engage with, as been said, One Life, Dolores Huerta. And it will yield our first collaboration with our third poet this evening, Arlene Biala. The printed program for tonight's event, which I hope you all have in hand, includes biographical sketches of our three distinguished poets. But what I want to say right now is this. All three, like myself, are natives of California, from where I recently returned after taking part in a memorial tribute to a recently departed poet and dear friend. I think Juan Felipe, Diana, and Arlene will agree with me when I say that the ethos and spirit of our now departed poet friend is in sync with the ethos and spirit behind the exhibit we're celebrating tonight. So with this in mind, I want to close these remarks with a brief poem titled Ode to Dolores Huerta by the late Francisco X. Alarcón. Because you were the strongest, caring, mother, protesting against social injustice and the new war. Your ribs were broken many times over. 
your spleen smashed, split, and you were thrown like any rose to the ground, clubbed down on the street by the SFPD. But Dolores, you remain a May carnation on the lips of our people in prayer and in praise. Francisco X. Alarcón. And now, without further delay, please welcome our poets who will be presenting in this order, Arlene Biala, Diana Garcia, and Juan Felipe Herrera. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody? Very, very good. Maraming uh, salama. Thank you, mil gracias to Taina for a beautiful, beautiful exhibit. If you have not seen the Dolores Suerta One Life exhibit, please go check it out before it leaves here in May. Uh, and to Francisco, my heart to you for sharing that poem from our beloved Francisco X. Alarcón. I'm going to share um, a couple of poems tonight that were inspired by the exhibition. And one of the quotes from Dolores Huerta is, when you have nothing left, you still have your body. And it's, a, it's around the concept, very prevalent in civil rights activism and social justice, that you use your body for teach-ins, for sit-ins, for protest, and that is what will carry forward. <clears throat> oh, hey, a valley, oi, hey, calico, eh, he, co, nua, ah, o, cale, hua, oh, my, ke, a la, e, a, hane, ah, e, hone, tu, vele. Atuva. Hey, you know, I know, Dolores Huerta. What is the song of your body? Is it corrido and cundiman? A love song of resistance? Is it de colores and dahil sayo? The chorus of huelga, huelga the same word in Spanish and in Tagalog. What is the song of your body standing barely five feet tall, yet shifting mountains, lifting the voices of thousands of women who say enough, it is time to rise? What is the song of your fingers that grip the megaphone? Bass notes mean business. Don't be a marshmallow. Get off the sidewalk. Get into the street. Out, out from the mud. Out, out from the pesticides. Out from the weight of your broken bodies. What is this song of your hands that write the contract for the first time, that wipe the blood from your face? What is this song of your hands on your hips, ready to hear the excuses that crop up as they always do? But you are here. This uh, poem actually is a series of a, a poetry form called Ainaku. And it's a play off of the short form haiku, um, which is most of you might be familiar with. Raise your hand if you know what a haiku is, right? So five, seven, five, syllable count, uh, tercet. This is also a tercet, so three lines, but the form is basically one word, two words, and then three words, and it can be reversed as well. And ainaku is a, a form that was originated and founded by my uh, beautiful friend, a Filipina poet, Eileen Tabios, and uh, Ainaku means, the translation is sort of like uh, 
ay Dios mío, or oh my God. You know, you're just sort of like, oh, what in the world, right? So I would like for you, um, if you would indulge me, to help me with this poem, with this chant. And when I raise my hand like this, if you would yell out, huelga, okay? I'm going to need everybody with me. Okay, first one, huelga. Dragon lady, they call you. All men except for you. Same word, Tagalog and Spanish. Red vest, your body rising. You demand, commit your body. Blood grapes, strike the heart. Baton smash, ruptured your spleen. Eleven children, find a way. The Filipinas are tired too. Larry It Leong, we are here. Exhausted women, lead the march. Hunger striking, that is love. See her, red mother rising. Beyond this, she is here. Same age as my mother. No back seat, do not buckle. Hospital bed, Cesar is there. Same word, we are you. My sister, take this water. Our sister, take this breath. Thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> The first poem is called Delta Angel, and it's taken from an uncredited photograph called Dolores Huerta as a Majorette. It's part of the family holdings. I never knew. Main Street Angel, glitter in your Majorette costume, each sequin hand sewn, strut for the camera. Your baton waves, arcs, ready to fly. Passers by stop, admire your exuberance. Spine straight, taller than your friend beside you, taller than you thought you would be. All eyes follow your form, slim waist, high breasts, grace and strength in each toss of the baton. This is you, tasseled cape hat, set to lead the band every parade, every Friday night, every Friday night halftime, every band competition. Who taught you intricacies of baton work? Who taught you confidence, the feel of hard steel in both hands, working the baton from one hand to the other, over, under, above, through, between? Sometimes the clonk on the head. How many bruises suffered for this one moment each week, Delta Angel leading the way, charging headlong beneath a late autumn sun? In the heat, Delta water flushes your heart and lungs. Delta soil lifts each time your boots hit their mark. On Friday nights, your baton arcs beneath the lights, a hundred yard stage just for you. Lights bounce off baton sequins. Lights swirl like, dark, like stars against your dark skin and skirt. You hear the delta call of sandhill cranes settling, snowy egrets flying overhead. You pull for the star, strain against gravity. Your baton streams in the fog, wing shimmer. This next poem, Huelga, after Harvey Richards' 1965 photograph, Huelga. September 24, 1965, Delano, California. You remember this day. How can you forget? Iconic, this photo. Outsize reproduction guiding us in. The grape strikes in Delano, where it all began and you were there. Look at you atop a truck, sun in your eyes. You squint, sensible clothes, sleeves pushed up past your elbows, your get to work look. Comfy dark slacks, nothing you'd wear to church, nothing you'd wear turning trays. You turn from side to side, arms tired from holding the sign. It looks heavy. The word huelga feels heavy. Think of what this word means to all those who follow you out that day. 
Think of the lives, cha lives changed by this one word, workers daring to claim their lives, daring to think their arms, backs, legs should earn them more than subsistence wages, Care more than a quick meal midday, more than those furtive trips to the edge of the fields hunkered down against prying eyes, more than dry eyes and drier throats. The heat rises, pushes against your face, singles you out atop that truck. You must wonder if even now someone has you in their crosshairs. You must wonder what would happen to your children, but you can't think about them because this is about your children. This is about all the children, about all these young workers ready to walk out, ready to follow you, ready not to grow old beneath another hot sun. A 300-mile march. NFW flags bluster and blow. The valley winds blow from the east, new day, new beginnings, a few dozen workers. They hoist the flags, take their first steps, a 300-mile march. Audacious, Filipino and Mexican field workers daring to cast their struggles across the length and breadth of California's great central valley. So few, you'd hoped for dozens more. But the media trucks soon bloom. Photographers, newspapers cover the story. The story grows and so do the numbers. What do hundreds of boots and sandals sound like as they pound asphalt up Highway 99 and all its tributaries? The storm of passion, tectonic surge, the rumble and roar beneath the feet, the earthquake and hurricane and Scirocco, and what else can we call it but mad howl of parents past telling children there is not enough food, not enough for new clothes, warm jackets, clothes that fit, not enough for the doctor when one child struggles to breathe, not enough air, not enough money, never enough, and now huelga they scream, si se puede they roar, and if that's not enough, ya basta, enough, they have had enough. The next dragon lady is taken from an uncredited photograph of Huerta at the, at the Gallo negotiations in 1973. Remind you of something? Men in charge. Usually men, usually white men in white shirts and perfectly knotted ties. Good old boys taught to tie a tie in front of a bathroom mirror at age 12. But here in this simmering heat, they've shed the ties the suits and jackets, hunkered down, ready to take you down, even as you prepare to break the wall they've built word by word, line by line, point by point. In your checked jacket and white blouse, they should remember the images of wives at church, small armies of women wielding power, ancestral lines of women behind them they should recall who wields the final word in any disagreement. What do they call women like you behind their back? Don't think about it. Your hand moves across one of several pages strewn across the table. The man to your right follows each movement, each cross out, cringes as your pen ho hovers over one critical section. See him flinch as you grasp its importance. When Cesar handed you this responsibility, you crammed for one week, reviewing all you'd learned about contract negotiations in the past years. First the dates and lettuce, now wine and raisin grapes. You must have felt like you were back in college cramming for finals. You did now what you did then. When you got to the hall, you walked through the doors as if you were leading a field full of strikers. You claimed the best seat, but looked aside, not straight at them, not yet. You gave them a chance to grasp you were the lead negotiator, not Cesar, not a man trained in law school, but you with your state college degree, you mother of half a dozen children, you mother to this movement. Dragon lady, 
That's what they'll call you at the end of this day. Dragon lady, howling heat and dust on this contract, summoning decades of sweat and blisters and bent backs, twirling lassos of words, specific words, demanding words, gorging on the power of words to dismantle. And finally, different ways to heal. And this is from a photograph by Victor Aleman of Chavez sitting with Dolores Huerta in the hospital after she'd been beaten and her spleen ruptured and ribs broken by San Francisco's police. You watch. You sit and watch, hour after hour. What else can you do? You can't heal her. No one can do that. You can't take away the nightmare, the feel of metal baton on shoulder, hip, kidney. You can't remove the sound, the memory of flesh crumbling beneath the weight and power of San Francisco's finest. You wait, not like waiting those long months before you sign the first contract. Your eyes stray to her, stay away from her, this woman who's stood by your side who worked with you to found this union, this woman who agreed the Mahatma's way of nonviolence augured well for the stance you all would take in the face of hate-filled faces, fists that slowed your chants, your songs, your flying flag into oblivion. You turn away from the photographer, your face obscured by your left hand. Do you regret not being at her side when the police attacked? Are you racked with guilt? Aware of what your gente will say, those back home who expect a man to take the blows, not the woman. You wait because there is nothing else you can do. You wait because surgery only heals the body, but what of the soul? Bound to a hospital bed, draped in white, propped up on pillows, she strays, stares straight ahead, not at you. No smile, no attempt at conversation, the dragon lady holds herself close. That's beautiful. I'm so honored to be here with Diana and Arlene, uh, to listen to their amazing poems, to, uh, to feel and to see those moments once again uh, presented in many ways at Taina's uh, uh, gallery room uh, project on Dolores Huerta, One Life, and to be in the midst of uh, women leaders right here. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wave of creativity. It's a wave of uh, being brave and of being pioneers. And this is what I uh, mentioned to Telemundo just a few minutes ago. And for me, it's a beautiful honor. And I can feel uh, Dolores Huerta here. So let's give our mujeres our leaders right here, a big man, a big hand. And, and that's, that's right. That is right. That is right. Uh, also to, again, once again, give thanks to uh, the Library of Congress's uh, Department of Literature, Rob Casper, uh, and the Poetry Center as well, and uh, Letras Latinas, Norton da Notre Dame Institute with Francisco Aragon, and all those that are part of this project. Uh, I feel really good about it because it's, once again, as we can see, as you can see, uh, it's bringing into our minds and into our presence right here in Washington, D.C., in this amazing gallery, uh, the face and the life of Dolores Huerta, a most brave, and most keen mind and leader and activist on the ground, on the earth, for so many. And it's so easy for our leaders, in particular women, to be uh, slowly erased or evaporated uh, by the media and, of course, by the onslaught, the continuous corporate onslaught of uh, things to purchase and all those other good things. Let me read you a poem uh, of uh, on Jose Montoya, 
uh, Jose Montoya, who also passed away uh, not too long ago, uh, a great poet, uh, muralist, painter, who early on was part of the uh, uh, campesino movement uh, with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the farm workers. He was also a farm worker uh, from Escabosa, uh, Nuevo Mexico and New Mexico. And he uh, painted uh, these stories on amazing murals uh, throughout California in the Southwest uh, with his uh, 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 artists of Sacramento, many artists from Sacramento, of the Royal Chicano Air Force, and uh, gave, gave uh, you know, a large public face and uh, history through the visual uh, images and uh, documents from an artist's point of view. So he dedicated his life to this. So uh, he passed away um, in 2013. And I thought I'd bring him into view tonight um, since he was a great participant uh, with Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. So this is an ode to Jose Montoya. And I have it in Spanish and, and Pachuco Spanish, uh, the kind of Spanish, you know, you speak, we speak, uh, uh, all kind of in between everything, <laughs> uh, you know, on the borderlands, on the border, and as we grow up, and before we take Spanish one like I did, <laughs> and then Spanish two, and three and four, and, I, and ideally you make it to Spanish five. <laughs> Uh, Ode to Jose Montoya, uh, Oda para Jose Montoya. So how, so how are we going to do it now with your Pachuco portfolio? And that trip about the Tirilongo bad dudes from Second Ward, El Paso, and the campesinos with hard work, headbands, and revolution, and that rap on the three streets, braided, border, border frontera, boulevard. And now you come out on the bomber VW van, Nirvana, painted murals, solar blast off incense, copal danzante, sacred, the blessing of Tonantzin, and the tiny earth red, color of chile from hatch, roasted, 20 kilos in each leg, gunny sack. And now your art fire on adolescent foreheads, in the hearts of generations, Jose your kindness, your voice, dooby dooby doo wop. Give me the flying coat, color of flame and tutti frutti. Paint me the face, color lion barrio and color of Cesar Chavez Dolores Huerta flag. And do not forget the how. You hear it? You hear it all the way from Logan Heights barrio to Sacra. Jazz of the 40s across I-5 and 99. Viva Jose Montoya. Forever. A sweet forever. My brother. Oye, y ahora como le vamos a hacer con tu pachuco portfolio y ese tripe de los tirilongos. Del segundo. Y los campesinos con paliacates en revolución. Y esa tórica de las tres calles trenzadas en una frontera boulevard y ahora ya sales en ese bomber VW van Nirvana pintado mural solo blast off incense copal danzante la bendición de Tonantzin y esa tierrita colorada color chile de hatch rostizado 20 kilos en saco de isle y ahora tu pintura en llamas en frentes adolescentes en adolescent foreheads En corazones de generaciones, ¿qué más, José? Tu bondad, tu voz de dubi dubi duap. Píntame esos tramos color cielo desarraigado. Píntame los drapes color fuego y tutti frutti. Píntame la cara color león del barrio y color bandera César Chávez y Dolores Huerta. Y no se te olvide este grito. ¿Lo oyes? Desde la Logan hasta Sacra. Jazz de los 40s y a través de ese 5 y 99. Que viva José Montoya. Que viva Dolores Huerta. Que viva César Chávez. Para siempre. Siempre cito. Carnal. Con zafos. Thank you so much. Do it. 
now. <laughs> This is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Mm -hmm. yeah. You're first. Okay. You're first. Oh, I'm first. I'm first. <laughs> and last. And last. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is mine. <laughs> the, Diana, Diana, by the way, Diana and, uh, and Arlene structured this choreographic uh, choreo poem. <laughs> Let's give them a mano right before it begins. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe better they should clap afterwards if it works. If you hear the laughing coming from the back, back of stage, it's because we forgot to turn off our microphones while we were doing this. <laughs> Hopefully you couldn't hear a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, to I told Diana uh, and, uh, and Arlene, you know, we're just going to flow, okay? You know, it's, we're just going to just let it flow. And uh, then I went back into the... Uh, into the, uh, into the green room, to the cilantro room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Diana was busy, and Arlene, they were busy putting it all together. You know? I said, okay. Slow nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know like that. <laughs> okay. Siete lenguas, seven tongues, abuelo Herculane said, back in time, Norte, Nuevo Mexico said, use seven tongues, talk so fast. Wind and lightning, last time I saw you, behind Bakersfield. Must have been 2012, high school scholarship fundraiser. We pronounced you poet laureate of Kings County. If no one else does it, no one else does it, we'll do it. Si se puede, Dolores. Bottom line, still in 2016, more food, more clean water, more Walk the street with us into history. Get off the sidewalk. Work for justice. Aztec eagle, dragon lady, twirl talons, feathers, cape of sharp and pointed, swirled blast of breath, furnace roar. We are all saying the same thing. Spanish, English, Tagalog. Some who can read it, others will teach. I'm thinking about what is missing, and you are calling us in. More dollars get to school after all these years. More food, more peace, more marches. That is what you taught us. Use the feet. Use the hands. Manos, manas. Each step kisses the earth. Scarred, bombed, burned. Preemptive bombas, forsaken, bloodied. We are the workers that heal it. Ego. Funnel cloud, funnel force, la fuerza de la mujer. Create, create a movement. Use your feet, your hands, your brains, your mouth. Power through wind and lightning. Thunder roars from talons. Lightning springs. You are the only woman in the room at the table. Legal pad pages poised and ready to strike. Two men sitting to your side are joking around, wondering when lunchtime is and what you will be asked to bring. Rows of men sitting behind you some slumped in their chairs. Before they leave, they've left. <laughs> Next. Eagle Dragon, Eagle People, Pilgrimage Clan, walking nowhere to change for the good, for, for the usurped, for all. Scorched fields, no marshmallows here. Marshmallows roast in summer heat. Valley weather, tie the vines, turn the trays. We are all saying the same thing. The difference is your red knit vest, small enough to be a child's, with the black eagle soaring across the room toward us. The first thing I notice, your rib cage swelling, heart almost bursting through, held back only by the weaving of milagros, chanted into each click of knitting needles that were offered up to protect you. At the foot of the fountain, some cannot see it, some cannot read. Walk out of the fields, walk out, walk into history, see your children glide, university halls. This is what we do, we lead, we lead, we march into history. 
Your fierce small body relentless beyond miles, beyond broken ribs, you call us to that eagle that soars, proclaiming in every language, here is what America is. We are what America is. Siete, seven, one, compassion, two, struggle, lucha, three, debate, analysis, four, fast, fast for 30 days, just water. Five, call the people. Six, knock on every door. Seven, lifetime. One, your, yours, for all lifetimes. Knit, vest, with each name of the invisible eyes, the thread, a path, a pilgrimage with the estandarte of la Virgen. Walk with us into history. Fly with us into better lives. More food, clean water, new shoes, damn it. Nothing from La Segunda. Imua, rise, fuelga, beyond what is present in the hallway. Come, enter the heart cave. Rise, we are all saying the same thing. Enter the room, enter the room. Eagle that soars beyond broken ribs, within broken ribs, you, we, Filipina, Chicana, Mexican, wiry student mothers, you who step with peace for all broken rib healers. Rise with us where eagle meets dragon, sheer magnitude, sheer chutzpah. Claim your power, magnificent energy, all forward, onward, cause la causa. Que viva la causa! Get off the sidewalk, walk, find your life, our life. My mother Lucha, my father Felipe. Valle San Joaquin, 1947, Arlene, Indiana. Valle, D.C., 2016. Knit, vest, white, red, blackness, green, light, flame. Silk screen, Esther Hernandez, artista on the wall, who played with dirt. Parents, picked. Uvas. Eagle dragon, what kind of clan, what kind of movement screams, huelga, 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 moves with us, walks the streets with us, out of the fields, walks with us, marches a march, get marching, use your lives. Dragon lady roars, use your lives, make the world a better place, better, always better. The world becomes as you move it. How do you move it, Dolores? That was really wonderful, wonderful. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you a few questions. Can you talk about your process, both writing your poems in response to the exhibit, One Life, Dolores Huerta, and working in collaboration? I think um, for me it was having met her when I was young, when I was still 18, 19 years old, and um, having the having the great good fortune to have Luis Valdez and Teatro Campesino come onto campus at Fresno State and say, come with us into the fields. And I think that that, and then combined with Taina Caragol and all the wonderful work she did on the exhibit, and then Francisco Aragon texting and saying, do you want to do this? And I thought, well, hell, my, fine, my life finally came full circle. It's about time. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was a perfect opportunity to study these photographs and to have a chance to put passion, emotion, history, and memory in alongside the photographs and then write these poems. Wonderful. Do you have any comments? I do. I think um, echoing what Diana was saying, the work as you enter this room is so powerful. And for me, the very first thing that my eye went to was Dolores Huerta's vest that was gift gifted to her. And I think we all brought that into the poems when we were writing about the work. Just a very small, 
tiny vest, and it's in a shadow box frame. And I looked at it, and I thought, man, that thing's going to bust out. <laughs> right? Because you immediately make the connection with the woman and the power she held. Um, and, and when Juan Felipe uh, and Francisco had called and asked if, if I would like to participate in this, first of all, I was completely floored and humbled and honored. Um, it was also around the time that there was a very important movie by a Filipino uh, uh, producer, Melissa Arroy, Marissa Arroy, excuse me, um, that was screening in San Jose, and it's called the Deleno Manungs. And it talks about the Filipinos' history in the movement um, and, and sheds light into the fact that, you know, the different cultures, the Filipinos and the Mexicans were very much, even though there was some warring and struggle, were very much together and wanting the same things. So uh, that vest and all the other works that are in that room um, very much call forth a lot of, of, of hope and inspiration. Do you have anything to add, Juan Felipe? Well, you know, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> but it's really all been said, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm really, um, I'm really, really happy, again, you know, that, this, that uh, Taina uh, put this project together on Dolores Huerta here at the National Portrait Gallery and that um, the Department of Literature, uh, Rob Casper and Anya and, and Matthew uh, uh, are part of this and sponsored it, as well as everyone else. Uh, I thought, you know, I've been, it's been a concern of mine to, uh, to, uh, to have uh, such, such um, pioneers as Alores Huerta as much as possible in, in the public's uh, eye. You know how much media we get every three seconds? You know, there's, there's ph pharmaceutical ads, uh, there's everything in the w whole wide world that costs billions, billions, literally, uh, after a while, of dollars uh, that we receive in the media. But we never really receive uh, 10 seconds of Dolores Huerta, for example, in the media. I don't think, I don't think I've seen Dolores Huerta in the media at all. Uh, and the entire farm workers movement, and still Cesar Chavez. And in addition, we do not receive the Filipino, Filipina story. Uh, so, so I feel that this project bring such amazing, important, significant uh, faces for us to see once again, and, and, and um, courage for us to feel once again, incredible courage, and a movement for us to get in touch with once again uh, that changed our lives, and still is, cha is changing our lives, and is part of all the production that we uh, benefit from. In every hamburger, there's, there's lettuce and tomato and pickle and jalapeno. <laughs> <laughs> and I say like that because I'm joking with you, but it's true. So, so that's why I feel this is so important. And then, of course, it, it touches back to uh, my own story and our stories, uh, my parents, and how hard they worked uh, back in those early years when there was no union and at a later age in their life. And my father was kept on working until he was 70, so in those fields. So it's, a, it's like that. It's such a beautiful moment to be here. It is, yes. yes. And, and in general, what can ekphrastic poetry contribute to such an exhibit? Images. Mm -hmm. Images coming from the San Joaquin Valley and knowing Stockton as, as well as I do because so many family members live there, to know that she came out of Stockton and, and ran through the entire Central Valley. For me, it was the sounds, the scents, the feel of the fog in the winter and the heat in the summer. For me, it was just drenched with sensory detail. And then the shouts, the shouts for justice and the sights, the huge red banners with that screaming eagle on it. That's, it was all imagery. And how do you connect to Dolores Huerta? Well, well you know, I met her in, uh, not, not too long ago, uh, and, uh, and just recently, uh, in her uh, early 80s, early 80s. And this was in, uh, in Bakersfield. 
And I was invited to say something uh, at, uh, as a California Poet Laureate mm -hmm. uh, to a high school fundraiser uh, audience. It was uh, maybe around 50 people in Bakersfield at Cal State University, Bakersfield. And uh, this, this particular group has been raising funds, having speakers come, raise funds for the next generation of students that are going to continue. And not much money was raised, but a beautiful effort was made. And Dolores Huerta was there. So I got to say hi and, I, and thank you. And I noticed how uh, she's, she's, a, she's a solar being. She's a solar being. She just emanates all this beautiful, strong, bright, brilliant energy. And we talked a little bit. And she said, well, you know, Juan, uh, I wanted to be a poet. She said, I wanted to be a poet in third grade. But my teacher uh, said I didn't have any talent. So then she decided on something else, which you guys know about. <laughs> yeah, very important things, of course. <laughs> and, but it was a very tender moment for her. I noticed this, this feeling she was feeling about being taken, ripped away from this poetry she wanted to, this poet, poet, poetry life she wanted to have, because she had it, because she was called Siete Lengua, Seven Tongues, by her grandfather, which we know how she used that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know what, Dolores, we're going to take care of that right now. <laughs> we're going to take care of that right now. So just hold on right now, OK? I said, OK, everybody, as of today, we're announcing, by the power vested in me, <laughs> the Kings County Poet Laureate, and because uh, that's the county, you know, that uh, Bakersfield is in. <laughs> Kings County Poet Laureate, and everybody goes, yeah! <laughs> so she's a beautiful human being, and the most, and I got, I was so fortunate to have met her at that time. I saw her last year at the Mexican Embassy when she got the Aguila Azteca Prize. Yeah. Uh, and she looked marvelous. She's just an amazing, an amazing person. What about you? How do you connect to Dolores Huerta? Dolores Huerta, um, I didn't get to ever speak with her, but I did get to see her. She came to the Mexican Heritage Plaza, which is now the School of Arts and Culture in San Jose, which is the Safeway site of the original uh, Cesar Chavez boycott in San Jose. And she came on the day when we had <laughs> I think 3,000 fifth and sixth graders there from the neighborhood schools. Um, huge, huge, you know, we have the Cesar Chavez Day on March 31st in San Jose. And so she was there spreading her power and joy <laughs> to these fifth and sixth graders that covered, you know, I don't know how many, how many square feet, but it was just a packed <laughs> plaza. But the thing that I really connect with her is that she's the same age as my mother. She's probably, my mother's probably, she probably has maybe half a foot of height on my mother, but man, what a powerhouse, mm -hmm. right? This is, you know, going back to thinking about the body and what it can contain and what it can barely contain when it comes to uh, life and that soul, um, that fierceness that was needed to do the work that she did. Yeah, you know? that's right. Um, it's amazing, thank you. Um, in the United Farm Workers, uh, shall we talk about the United Farm Workers? My own parents left the fields when I was seven years old, when I was two, but finally and completely by the time I was seven. So my early life was, work, was living in Camp CPC, California Packing Corporation. What I remember is those very early mornings in the fields, sitting on my father's gunny sack while he dragged me along because I couldn't do my share of picking, or I wouldn't, one or the other. Um, <laughs> yes. and, and when they started this movement, I remember my mom and I sitting around in the living room talking about a union for farm workers. And by this time, I was 15, 16 years old. And it seemed like such an inconceivable project. It's like, but the, the biggie, I should say, is that even then, Dolores Huerta was well known in the central San Joaquin Valley. And for my mother, this is a woman who was only a couple of years older than she is. For my mother, this woman 
who was leaving her family behind and walking out into the fields and pulling the workers out was so removed from anything she would ever have imagined for herself. And I think that not only did Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers inspire us, those of us who were teenagers and young adults, but they inspired women of my mother's age who eventually in her 40s went back to college. And so I say that you say that it's a union and a farm workers union, but we say that it was a people's movement and it was more than just the United Farm Workers. It grew us up. Mm -hmm. That's right. Do you want to add to that? No, I think I'll leave it. <laughs> Juan Felipe? That's, that's right, you know, uh, that's, that's right. You know, uh, uh, Diana says it, you know, said it, says, it, says it well. Um, you know, we also, it's good to acknowledge uh, uh, the community organizing, organizers that uh, kind of shared uh, their methods uh, with Dolores and Cesar Chavez. Uh, is it Fred Ross? Uh, Jewish uh, community organizer. Uh, that's also part of uh, of the of the um, of the movement. And uh, as uh, Arlene and um, Diana have said, all this is kind of part of our lives. You know, this is what we've been uh, writing about and talking about and reading about, uh, reading about and and kind of keeping the fires going uh, with the uh, with this this particular movement. I. I kind of came into uh, my own poetry at that particular time in the late 60s at UCLA, and I was testing the free speech mound. I was really testing myself to see if I could get up there and, uh, and read out and speak out, because I was always, it kind of became my life project. I don't know what got into me, but I, I noticed that I had a hard time speaking up in, uh, in seventh grade. And people would ask me, uh, what am I? And I would say, I'm Hawaiian. I, 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 want, I wish I was, you know. I wish I was, you know, because I had come in from I had come in from the Bay Area and uh, I had gone to school in in the Mission District, so my friends were Filipinos, you know, and Filipinas at school, you know. Honolulu uh, Naipo uh, would, would always run ahead of me. I was trying to catch up to her, <laughs> but she was so fast and so tall. And uh, Tyrone Aquino and Alfredo Bautista. Uh, so when I came to San Diego uh, to go to middle school. Uh, my music teacher said, well, you know, what are you anyway? I go, what? I <laughs> uh, said, God, you know, I don't know. I'm, uh, it, uh, God, I wish I could say Mexican, but, you know, uh, I'm Hawaiian. I'm Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, but I was so afraid to really speak up and to tell the truth. So I, I, I took choir and I started putting myself in impossible situations so I could, you know, kick it out of my body, force it out of my, by my body to speak up and to be true. So uh, the, the, the farm workers movement kind of made that happen for me. And that's where I started uh, uh, really writing and reciting in op open fields, open audiences, uh, my poetry. If you're an honorary Hawaiian, you hang out with a guy named Barack. What's that? If you're an honorary Hawaiian, now you hang out with a guy named Barack. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be delighted, <laughs> truly honored. <laughs> Truly honored. And did the exhibition deepen your understanding of Dolores Huerta, this exhibit, this, yeah. the, uh, here in the gallery? Yeah. It did. I didn't have the personal history of, uh, you know, family working uh, in the fields and uh, as, as Diana's family and Juan Felipe's family did. I mean, I had uncles and aunts who were definitely in our, in Santa Clara Valley, we were surrounded by the onion fields and that's where they went to do their work. Um, cousins in Hawaii actually who were on the plantations and the cane fields, uh, you know, up until very recently when they closed down. Closed down. My, uh, so, so this exhibition really, you know, things I didn't know, I didn't know she had 11 children and Marvelous. was doing all this work. Yes. And that alone to me, you know, I have three children and I'm like, That's amazing. <laughs> okay, I can't complain about being tired. Yes. Um, just again, back to that, that core strength that she Her had, strength. you know, she, and, and I didn't know that her life as a young child, you know, she was actually middle class and was not herself working in the fields, but when she went to teach, her young students were coming to school with no shoes, she knew they hadn't eaten because they didn't have any food, and that was the point where she said, mm. how can I sit here as a teacher and try to teach the, you know, writing, reading, art, what have you, 
when they, these children don't have their basics That's met. Right. That's right. And so it's at that core of her passion and her uh, commitment to making sure that there's justice, you know. And that's really the core of um, how I feel about your work and your writing, which is that if we don't have that part within us to generate work, whether it's ecrustic, you know, work based on works of art or, or inspired by dance or theater, um, or a way to express anger at, you know, La Trompa or whatever, all these ridiculous <laughs> things that are happening in the media. That you wish this a bad joke, but you realize, I'm awake, what's going on, right? So um, to really remember to engage and, and be well with yourself so that you can share that positive energy out. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's women like Dolores Huerta and people who who are consistent in that bringing forth the core um, that I try to engage with all the time because the rest is just gonna make you fall down and cry, right? So. Yeah. It's wonderful that they had the exhibition here for a new generation to yes. see this marvelous, amazing woman. Isn't that true, Neveda? That's true, you know, there's new, there's new generations. And uh, so, so that's what's also beautiful about this project is that we have, um, we have ourselves and then we have our new selves and, and our new generations that are learning about this and it's a beautiful thing to have uh, here on site and Dolores Huerta at the center and Arlene and Diana as well and yourself and everyone here. What does it mean that the federal institutions such as the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress are celebrating Dolores Huerta? The walls have come down, you know? The walls have come down, and there's mighty bridges being built. And that's what's amazing, you know, uh, that we're, uh, we're uh, uniting and doing the good work. Of course, there's a lot of good work already at the Library of Congress and at the gallery, uh, and yet uh, this is a new, uh, a new leaf in, in that, uh, a new direction or a continued direction in that field. So I think it's the most inspiring, especially at a time like this. That's right. A time like this is true. And I never imagined a moment like this would come. And I have one more question. And what might that fact say about the message of her work, which you are promoting through poetry? That poetry is for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Poetry, uh, you know, uh, it's what she was doing all along. It's what she was doing all along with poetry for the people with her voice. And Arlene, and Diana, and yourself, and everybody here, one more time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, George Ed. We would Thank like you. to open the floor to questions. The microphones are on both sides of the auditorium. Um, I had a, uh, thank you so much for this evening's uh, program. Um, not only is this exhibit the first time that uh, a Latino has been honored by the Smithsonian in this way, uh, but I believe you know it's the first time that a living person has been given this honor, or, or, or one of the first ones. Uh, what does it mean to have this project and um, her life presented in this way, that history presented while the person is still living. And I'm curious as, as people who've created poetry around the project and around her life, can you say something about what it means, the responsibility of the poet to sort of honor someone who's living at the same time? I teach my students to write the truth. And I feel like there has been no truth written about Dolores Huerta that has had a bigger hearing than the presentation we're doing tonight. That the exhibit is one that blasts apart a silence that has kept her in second place and with no one recognizing that she was the co-founder 
of the United Farm Workers. And I just am so, uh, I'm so amazed that a moment like this can happen to honor her when she is still alive, that it's so tiring to hear the accolades after amazing people like this are dead. Very good, very good. Any other questions? Thank you very much to all of you for putting this on, um, especially um, the poets here tonight and Ms. Dorn for hosting the discussion, all of you are putting it on. I had actually a different question in mind, but then when um, Juan Felipe, when you mentioned the anecdote about Dolores saying she wished we had a poet when she was three, mm -hmm. it made me actually think, think about, um, for example, you're saying a new generation and about President Kennedy who, if most of us who are familiar with his life story, I happen to be almost too intimately involved since I was named John and partly after him. I just know enough about his life story, just remotely having read through it, that as a young man, him being rather sickly and having dealing with a lot of illnesses, he actually read a lot. The joke in his family was that if a mosquito bit him, he might, this mosquito might die, actually, with all the illnesses that John had. And anybody familiar with Kennedy's story knows that Joseph was the first one actually in line for the presidency, but then fate intervened, and then John was next in line. My comment is simply like rather that you, having heard that comment from Dolores herself and you and poets in general, what do you think it means the fact that sometimes that her, the teacher said that comment or that President Kennedy himself, I, I was thinking of the context, the idea of like, um, he himself aspired to be a, a teacher and a, and a writer himself and, a, and maybe even a poet, but didn't quite work out that way. And whereas Dolores, that teacher said that comment, and yet, as you said, her life expressed herself in different ways and through the poetry of her a activity. So that was more just a commentary, but rather maybe if you want to reflect on that, what you think it all means in a way, at least for the next generation of those who are told not to do one thing, maybe go and do your own for your own path if you can. You know, you cannot stop the, uh, you cannot stop the spirit. You know, she, found, she definitely found a way, and uh, her poetry was a bigger poetry. It, uh, it, was, it was on a page, it didn't require ink. It was her, her voice and her actions and uh, this great solar power that she has of, uh, of uh, facing uh, impossible odds and uh, making it through and, and bringing about this, this beautiful change that we uh, have experienced. Uh, inspiration, uh, changing labor laws, inspiring millions and uh, new generations. So her poem was a mighty big poem. And she made it through. Yes. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Um, OK. Yeah, first of all, uh, I just really want to thank um, Taina for putting this on. This is, oh, man, it just blows me away. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, so we hear a lot of this um, when we're you know, celebrating Dolores Huertas' life. And I know she's still alive. But, um, we hear like, get off the sidewalk, you know, these calls to action. And um, well, first of all, actually, uh, Juan Felipe, I wanna um, commend you for taking the Poet Laureate's position in doing like really activisty type stuff with it and like really doing these big projects that unite people, you know, um, I think that's really beautiful. But my main question is, um, what, what, what do you say to the next generation? And you know, here we are like, we're growing, you know, we're here. Um, and I just, I, I wanna hear some words from you guys for the next generation. The next generation is here, for sure. I, um, what I tell my kids who, um, who I think have very, very, uh, great hearts, compassionate hearts, um, sharing empathy, but really have their own, their own desires of what they want to do. You know, I, I may say to my 15 year old, you're practicing your drums today, you're practicing your drums today, you're practicing your drums today. He's like, no man, I'm gonna go skate and I'm gonna go play my ukulele. <laughs> we can't hold any of you back and I think people like Juan Felipe as the U.S. Poet Laureate, first Latino U.S. Poet Laureate, Dolores Huerta here in the Smithsonian, you know, these things are huge. And I think it really creates, as, as Juan Felipe said, 
bringing down walls and just letting people know to stand up, to be heard, create your art, share your passion for the things that matter, you know. Um, hey, I'm on social media all the time. I'm guilty of Facebook and Instagram and all that, but move beyond that, you know, remember to connect with each other uh, in very meaningful ways. Um, and, and not get lost, you know, the whole get off the sidewalk, don't get lost, you know, you could maybe, <laughs> yes, you can forward, you know, a petition or something, but what does that really mean? How is that helping you grow and help, you know, each one teach one, right? Educate the next and help them feel strong to rise with, with you, with your whole generation. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. If, 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 I, if I could also ask a question, I, I yeah, yeah, thank, 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 thank you so much for, for tonight. I, I wanted to know if, if you've noticed with, 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 with Huerta and, and Chavez's life, if, if they, if they found. It, encouragement and influence from, from, from 20th century religious figures like Oscar Romero, Dorothy Day, Gustavo Gutierrez, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, if, if, if you notice them finding influence and encouragement from, 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 from figures like those. Well, most definitely, you didn't mention him, but from Gandhi. Mm -hmm. That was the, the core to their own nonviolent approach to union organizing, to striking, to picketing, mm -hmm. that this would be a nonviolent movement. Mm -hmm. The power of nonviolence to speak so much strong, stronger, so much more loudly than hitting back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You know, there were so many, that's right, just the question of religion is so big, isn't it? It's so big, like Virgen de Guadalupe and uh, the Estandarte, the big banner that kind of led the pilgrimage of La Virgen de Guadalupe and, 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 and beyond that and within that. Uh, you know, there were also um, a lot of songs, uh, a lot of poetry, a lot of theater, a lot of storytelling, and the famous uh, newspaper, uh, El Malcriado, the, the misbehave, misbe what's the word in English? El Marcado? The misbehaved one, the misbehaved one. The spoiled one, the spoiled one. No seas malcriado, Juanito. Don't be, you know, get over here. Uh, right, and you could see all those, all those corridos and all those notices and writings, and uh, even that newspaper inspired the, the younger ones at that time, uh, like myself. So we all created little newspapers in, in our communities, kind of modeled in some ways after El Malcriado with the local news of the day among the students and communities. So all those things are also part of this amazing uh, moment with uh, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, Filipino, Filipina, farm workers and leaders. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your questions. I'd like to thank the poets. I have to say that as a, as a curator of the show, um, you know, the main medium of exhibitions relies on visual material and on text, on the text that is on the walls. And I feel that through their art, Arlene, Juan Felipe, and Diana have really expanded massively what is on the walls in the show. And um, I could hear it and I could see it happening and it was, <laughs> right there as they, as they read. It was a very, very powerful moment, and uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Taina. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.